Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to what I believe is our 16th of our COVID-19 series, uh, brought to you by the Royal Society of Medicine, by health professionals and for health professionals. And by popular demand today, we're going to cover mental health. And equally by popular demand, well, actually more that I've invited them, but nevertheless, they will prove very popular. Um, I'll be pleased to welcome our two guests today. First of all, Professor Tim Kendall, clinical psychiatrist based in Sheffield, but now the National Clinical Director for Mental Health at NHS England, the Mental Health SAR, as we used to call them. And then Professor Ed Bulbon, Chair of Psychiatry at the University of Cambridge, prolific neuroscientist and an expert on infection, immunity and the brain, indeed the best-selling author of The Inflamed Brain. Now, gentlemen, before we start, we've asked uh, people what word are we not allowed to say this week? So if, and the, by popular demand, it is going forward. So if you say the words going forward, I will immediately switch you off. So, gentlemen, well, welcome there. Tim, I see you've got a suitably gothic background again. Um, as usual, as usual. Very impressive and very sinister. And Ed, where's Ed? Ed um, had another wonderful background. You look like you're in a Castle Barnard, perhaps. I'm not sure, but certainly somewhere like that. Okay, so let's, uh, Ed, let's kick off then. Um, so you, you are obviously, you've done huge amounts of research on neural networks, but also you've made a reputation for really bringing back to the fore of psychiatry the issue of inflammation, infection, and what it does to mental health, particularly depression, but other conditions as well. So from, but from your perspective then, what, what would you be anticipating might be the neuropsychiatric or neuroscientific, uh, neuropsych consequences of uh, a COVID-19 infection? Mm. Well, um, I'd say first of all, that there's a lot we don't know. Um, and uh, you know, we're gonna need to find out more quickly uh, as things uh, don't uh, go forward, but uh, continue to evolve. There is some data. So if you hear what people have been saying, and this started in China, of course, and, and the first reports came from China and, and subsequently Italy, France, wherever the epidemic has been particularly virulent, people have noticed that um, uh, patients with severe COVID quite often have uh, symptoms suggesting some disturbance of the brain. Um, and that can range from, you know, apparently quite trivial disturbance of uh, the sense of smell or the sense of taste, which has now been added by this government as, as one of the cardinal symptoms of COVID. Um, that's probably the most sort of um, minor neurological or brain related symptom that people are seeing. But then there are many others uh, ranging uh, all the way up to um, severe coma. So there is a, an argument that some of the patients with the most severe COVID who are requiring ICU and, and ventilator support uh, may have uh, disturbance of the, the respiratory centers that normally control breathing in, uh, in the, the brain stem. So there's a range of different uh, uh, presentations that people are seeing acutely. Uh, in this country, uh, uh, a week or so ago, uh, a case series of about 150 reports was published. All of these were COVID patients and all of them had some sort of neurological or psychiatric complication acutely. About two thirds of that was stroke. So it turns out that vascular complications of COVID are quite common, uh, not, not just in the lungs, but also in the brain. Uh, and then there was another big chunk of patients who had some kind of altered mental state, encephalitis, encephalopathy, but also quite a lot of new cases of psychosis, mood disorder, and cognitive impairment coming through. So it's clearly a, I would call it a neurotoxic illness. Um, we don't know necessarily the causes of that neurotoxicity. Um, it could be that the virus infects the brain. It could be that the immune response to the virus damages the brain, or it could be that the blood supply to the brain. <laughs> all of those mechanisms look plausible at the moment and the other th how, how, are you, how are you ed how, how are you going to how are you going to sort out those various possibilities well you know we just urgently need more data so you know with colleagues um uh, around the country we've been trying to get going on uh, an effort to collect uh data uh on pe on people who have covid and have any kind of psychiatric or neurological problem 
I think that's really going to be a very important foundation piece in all of this. And I think what's also important is that we think not just about what's happening acutely while people are in the hospital or, or dealing with the respiratory symptoms of COVID at home, but also what happens in the longer term. Because if you look at similar viral uh, uh, epidemics like SARS and MERS, uh, and you look at the sort of longer term uh, psychiatric sequelae of those epidemics, they're pretty uh, severe. Uh, so again, a, a recent uh, publication from KCL and UCL looked back meta-analytically at all the reports of psychiatric disorders following, following SARS or MERS. And, you know, up to 12 years of uh, follow-up after the acute illness, uh, they were finding um, quite high frequencies of PTSD, depression, anxiety, mm. insomnia, some mild cognitive impairment, perhaps the so-called dis-executive dis syndrome seems to be quite uh, frequently reported as a sort of longer term outcome. So, you know, I think this is a, uh, an illness that we need to take very seriously from a psychiatric and a neurological point of view, not just right now, but perhaps for months and years to come. I mean, there's no, no so doubt. There's no doubt that, that most of the surveys that are currently being done around COVID and mental health are saying that, that it's affecting people's mental health. Um, and that's in broad terms, especially anxiety and anxiety related conditions, including, interestingly, OCD. Um, but um, what we don't have is what's the, what's the quantifiable increase in more severe mental health problems like psychosis or whatever. Um, I mean, I, I would anticipate there would be some sort of rise, um, but we don't at this point know that. But um, you know, again, a, a, with PTSD, we'd be expecting a big rise in PTSD. That at the moment we can't quantify. Um, you know, after coming out of ICU, um, PTSD is quite common. Yeah. Um, well, let, 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 let's then put you on the spot, Tim. Surely this has been going on now for quite some time. And, and in terms of something like psychosis, which is fairly unmissable, shouldn't you have got a grip by now and know if there, if there is a, a greater rate of psychosis now or a breakdown uh, coming forward? Shouldn't, well, what, shouldn't you be... what we would expect is that, that you get a, a rise in people coming in to mm. for acute mental health. Uh, and as you probably are aware, there's been a drop in the use of the Mental Health Act. There's been a yep. drop in the use of, uh, of inpatient admissions. In fact, so much so that we've had one incredibly positive result in this is that the vast majority of places have now got no out of area admissions because they've got so many beds. So now early intervention services is another one that you would expect. But my understanding to date is that there hasn't been a national rise in the use of early intervention. But, but this, we've got to have this with, a, with a, a, an important caveat, which is that across the whole of health, there has been a drop in, in yeah. people coming forward, including an 80% drop in, a drop in uh, kids attending A&E with a head injury. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and do we yet have anything to suggest, I mean, deliberate self-harm, has halved, hasn't it, in A&E departments. Mm -hmm. But it would be a very brave person who said that deliberate self-harm itself has halved in the population. Are you going to be that brave? Or are you just thinking this is a, a wave coming up, trying to avoid using that phrase tidal wave, but anyway, that there is a tidal wave coming towards us as soon as people start to have confidence that they can go to A&E again or see a GP and so on and so forth. Well, at this, point, at this point in time, we've got, uh, we have got some quite important evidence around um, domestic violence uh, that we've got. It's about a 350% increase in general online domestic violence searches. So on the internet, um, we've got uh, about a 50% increase in child line referrals. Um, I actually think that, that, you know, the whole sort of thing around children is a real concern. So, I hear of parents really struggling with doing, you know, with education at home, um, really struggling with kids who've got neurodevelopmental problems, so, uh, you know, ADHD and um, autism, that the, these kids are under stress, I think. Now, 
you yeah. know, we, we haven't got a huge amount of very hard data except indirect things like use of, of child line and internet and, and so on. But it is something that we are very, we're, we're, we're gearing up about this. So we're, we are talking to chief execs, and medical directors and helping uh, trusts around the country to step up and start um, increasing, be more assertive, be more assertive to go out and find people, children in particular. Well, come back to you in a moment, Tim. First, quite a few people want Ed to come in and say just a little bit more about the neuropsychiatry here. Um, several people have asked about is what we're seeing a coagul I can't even say it's a coag co coagulation, co coagulopathy. Thank you. And others have said, is there something specific about COVID or is this another, just another, not just, but alongside the well-known phenomena of IT, ICU delirium? Can you just elaborate a little bit on that, Ed? Because quite a few people seem very interested yeah. in the differences. Okay. So I think there are probably multiple factors at play. If you think about what the, what the SARS-CoV-2 infection does to the brain, there are, there are multiple factors which range from things that are quite non-specific, like the effects of ICU treatment or the effects mm -hmm. of drugs that are often prescribed in those situations. But if you think, what, what could the virus itself be doing more directly? I think there are three big categories that people are focused on right at the moment. There is the coagulopathy angle, uh, which is emerging as a, as, as a feature of this virus that may account for hypoxia uh, and contribute to the respiratory problems as well as to the neurological problems. I mentioned the high incidence of stroke so far that uh, has been reported. Um, then there's the immune uh, idea. Uh, and you know we know that uh, the virus in many people, particularly the more severely uh, unaffected people, triggers an intense inflammatory response, sometimes called a cytokine storm, with very high levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines in circulation. And we know uh, from pre-COVID times that that kind of inflammatory state of the body uh, is uh, associated with a lot of um, psychiatric uh, problems, particularly fatigue, depression, uh, and some anxiety as well. Um, and then the third uh, mechanism, besides the vascular and the immune, the third uh, big uh, uh, option is that the virus infects the brain. And this is something that's sort of a little bit more specific to um, coronaviruses, um, that they have uh, multiple ways of getting into the brain. Certainly other viruses in animals as well as humans seem to have this capability of both infecting the brain from the bloodstream, but also infecting the brain directly um, through the peripheral nerves. Um, and, you know, I mentioned earlier that there's a high rate of um, disturbance of sense of smell, sense of taste. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know this for sure in relation to SARS-CoV-2, but in some other coronaviruses, it is clear that uh, the virus can get into peripheral nerves and it can propagate, spread backwards from the periphery into the central nervous system through uh, those sensory nerve fibers. Um, and, so that's is a, it, yeah. and then again, does that raise a possible spectrum of, of encephalitis lethargica? as a longer term outcome, Ed, or well, is that purely well, speculation? Yeah, I mean, I think we've got to, that, I think that is sort of, that would be the absolute worst case scenario. And I don't, I actually don't think there's any evidence that we're looking at anything quite as dramatic as that. I mean, just to put it in context, um, people think that there were something like uh, 5 million cases of encephalitis, encephalitis lethargica around the world. Um, well, that's um, you know, about uh, uh, two orders of magnitude greater than the total number of, of cases of, of COVID that we're seeing at the moment. And not all of those are, are neurologically complicated. So I think encephalitis lethargica and the Spanish flu epidemic that it was sort of historically yeah. coincided with from about 1915 to about 1925, that was a pandemic on a scale which we have mercifully not yet seen with COVID. Okay. Um, uh, of course, mm. in those days, the investigation of encephalitis lethargica and what, it, what caused it and how to treat it was all very primitive. I think now, 
uh, you know, about 100 years later, we should be in a much better position if we can get our act together soon okay. to, to work one, out what the causes one, of these problems are and how, figure out how best to treat them. One last question aimed at you, Lida Jasrasek has asked, um, do you know if neuropsychiatric outcomes have been included in the outcomes of the three large trials currently going on, like recovery and the others? I think people are trying to um, put neuro simple neurological and mental health outcomes into as many ongoing trials as possible. Um, I don't know that, it, that in every case they've been successful, but I mean, I think, uh, I think there is an awareness, uh, a higher level of awareness than there might have been a few years ago that mental health is going to be part of this. And people are putting those outcomes into trial designs and into uh, you know, other surveys, staff surveys, uh, and epidemiological work that's uh, up and running. So I think we are going to have more complete data on that. Uh, but uh, at the moment, as I said, uh, you know, right at the start, data is the thing we need most. Okay. So Tim, a question now for you has come in. This is basically mm -hmm. that um, has the, is the mental health of the nation, which is a concern, and you are the National Clinical Director of Mental Health, um, is that anything, however, to do with you, NHS England, or your local mental health trust? Or should, should you just be concentrating on those with pre-existing or new onset mental disorders? Or are we part of a kind of a more general recovery program for the whole population? What role do you think NHS England and your local mental health trust should be playing with the wider community as opposed to those in contact? Okay, I think that it's, it's a complicated answer. Um, not too long then okay simple answer public health england uh you know they they are leading you know the the public response to to these issues and you know in theory mental health services should be leading the the clinical and uh you know and service response to 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 this so the extent to which covid will provoke um worsening mental health problems either in people with existing mental health problems or indeed by provoking new issues and new cases, um, that of course is our business. But I think there's a, there's a more subtle answer, which is that um, we working in particular with the voluntary sector need to be much more supportive at, at a community level. Um, I mean, I, I've worked, my clinical work is, as you know, Simon, is working with homeless people. Um, and the response since COVID um, and since uh, the you know, communities and local government department have, have now put lots of money into getting people off the street, we've suddenly got a collective response. So we're working with the local authority, we're working with social care, we're working with primary care, general practice, we're working with substance misuse. And it is, it's, a, it's a really good multi-agency response. Now, I think that's what needs to happen at community level. We play our part and you know, what we're experts in is the treatment of mental ill health, but we are alongside others who are there also to support the community response. So, and I think this is particularly so with people who are very traumatized by this. Their community is their first port of call, their family, their, their friends and so on. And, and we don't want to interfere with that until they need us, but we need to be there. So I don't know if that's a bit too complicated a response. But. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. But we're going to have to find new ways of doing all these things. Um, Martha Scanlon from Bristol is asking, uh, given that many of us now are doing uh, much more online assessments, uh, patients brought in for risk reasons, do you think that that will now be how we conduct much more of our community outreach, outpatients, et cetera, for the ongo forever, basically? Um, I, I think there are some fantastic innovations that have happened, um, which don't always suit mental health quite so well, but they, they suit health generally. So running an outpatient clinic, um, follow-up clinic, by uh, you know, using video conferencing, um, with having a little waiting room where people come in, you can see when they come in. If you're prepared properly in advance, you can have a, a really efficient, very timely response to people um, and have follow-up clinics where people don't wait. I think that's fantastic. Um, 
I also think that, you know, helplines and uh, <clears throat> stuff around sort of um, initial assessments, maybe, you know, digital approaches might be helpful. But I don't think in mental health you can get away from the fact that an awful lot of communication is, is nonverbal. And you can't really see it down a video. So I, I think actually, and, and certainly from my point of view now, I, I don't do any assessments by video. I actually go in, I find a place where we can sit two meters apart, which in hostels and hotels um, or on the street you can do. Um, and yeah, you know, and, that, and that's how I do it. I don't wear PPE for that. If I can't get that social distancing, then I would wear PPE. Um, but again, that interferes with, that, with those things. So short answer, I think there are some great innovations um, that, that will come out of this. Um, yep. But I also think they have their limitations in mental health. And another question on that is, why can't we do Mental Health Act assessments remotely? Well, it's, it's a, you know, that's a sub answer of what I've just given, which is, you know, in some cases, and, and I, I must say, most people want to do video assessments for the Mental Health Act, not because there aren't enough psychiatrists, but because they're fearful of getting an infection. And that's entirely understandable. I think all frontline workers have that fear. Um, so, yes, it, it is possible, but I mean, I, I've, I, I, I'm... I sectioned somebody a month ago, and I can tell you there is absolutely no chance that we could have done that by video conferencing. Um, and you know, the, the, the basic rules about video conferencing and the Mental Health Act that we've put out is it's got to be by mutual consent. Mm. Now, I doubt that there are that many people who would mutually consent to this who are in a, an acute enough state to warrant the Mental Health Act. Yeah. I think that that's almost certainly true, um, and I'm sure that's right. Some some things, you know, just have to be done that way. And yeah. can you finally say, is there any intention um, of the NHS England or the government to actually um, institute the emergency powers that are, are there if needed um, to uh, make the Mental Health Act run? Uh, I don't know what the word would be, smoother, faster, whatever, but with with fewer protections in a time of crisis. That's been talked about, but as far as I know, it hasn't happened. No, it's not happened, and um, it re requires the Secretary of State uh, signing, uh, signing up to it, basically allowing this to happen. That in itself doesn't trigger it. The trigger is then by NHS England working with the regions to check out, is there a good case for this on a, on a local basis, and what mm -hmm. are the safeguards they've got in place, and then they could be triggered. Now, we have absolute assurances from the Secretary of State that that will be triggered very quickly if the, if the need arises. But the need has to be absolutely demonstrable. So we have to be able to show that there are gaps in rotors, that people really can't do it. And then we would be able to trigger those, those uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. But at the moment, our evidence is that we have not got a shortage uh, of psychiatrists and social workers that would warrant that. Okay. Now, you just mentioned some of the upsides of, of the current situation in the embracing of new technologies. This has happened across the health service, but also in mental health. Ed, in your world, any upside to this at the moment? Well, yeah, I, I, obviously it's not net positive, uh, but I think it is important to look for where there are upsides. I, I personally think, you know, the acceleration of digital innovation in the health service generally is, is probably an upside. I would add to what Tim said, you know, it's not going to be a complete solution. And also, it's very important that digital innovations like apps go through some kind of testing <laughs> scenario so that we're, we're not flooding the market, as it were, with, with apps that are quite easy to produce, uh, regulatory light touch at the moment, but may not work very well. So I think important to keep focused on evidence basing uh, digital innovation. But that I think, is potentially an upside. A couple of other things I just mentioned briefly. I think the, the, the you know, it, it's inevitable that we think about mental health in the context of physical health when we're thinking about COVID. And I personally think that's a good thing, generally. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that this uh, 
extraordinary experience we're living through as a medical profession that I hope serves to break down some of the traditional divides between psychiatry, neurology, and the rest of medicine. We can begin to think of patients as, you know, uh, entire um, uh, and the physical and mental health being quite closely linked in many cases. Um, and the, the smile I'd make is resilience. You know, um, not everybody who is exposed to the social shocks of the pandemic is going to be equally affected in terms of depression or anxiety. And I think we are in a position now to understand much more deeply and precisely what it is about individuals, some individuals that may make them more resilient to these kind of um, shocks. Uh, and if we can understand the, the factors that promote resilience, potentially we can boost them in people that, uh, who aren't naturally so well endowed, if I can use that expression. So I think resilience, mind-body integration, and um, thoughtful digital innovation, I would think, are all potential upsides. I mean, that's fine, Ed. I do remember uh, you making that speech about integrating physical and mental when I first met you, which was about before the First World War. So yeah. I think it's something we've been... the time of the encephalitis lethargica. It was indeed, yes. I think we've been talking about that a lot, yeah. and um, one does devoutly hope it will happen. Tim, yeah. a question for you here from... Um, oh, yeah, this is from, in fact, the Royal College of Psychiatrists saying, how can we be certain that the money promised in the um, long-term view, the long-term plan, will be honoured post-COVID? Um, we're tracking it, um, and we will be doing everything that we've been doing before to ensure that that money not only gets through, uh, but it gets through and is spent on expanding up mental health services at a time when we seriously need them. Um, and that, that effort will not stop. Um, and as you know, uh, Claire and I are both of one mind on that. We won't stop. We won't stop ensuring this happens. And Simon Stevens is completely behind it. Um, so I think yeah. we still stand a very good chance of that happening. But the worry everyone has is that mental health is, you know, a long-term game, and that given the size of the economic recession coming towards us, uh, which will hit us just about the time when we really will need certainly some expansion of mental health services will be the time when we're going to have to start paying the bills. But you're, you're okay about that? You think yourself, Claire and Simon, will, will manage that? I think we'll have to see. I think everybody will okay. be struggling in the same way. Um, but I think you're quite right that mental health, um, I mean, in a way, the cat's out of the bag. Everybody knows that mental health has poor outcomes for physical health, for yeah, you know, the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So now is the time to ensure mental health stays and, healthy. Okay, and then a final thing. Several people are asking about child mental health. Now we have Russell Viner coming very, very shortly, I think next week, to talk about uh, children in general. But anything you want to say, particularly, we haven't mentioned, LD, oh, I think you did, but LD and autism have come up as well um, as kind of special you know, categories. Oh, I think that there's, there's no doubt that, that what data we can get and what data we're getting now, and we are actively looking at this, is that uh, children and young people um, with autism, ADHD particularly, but generally children and young people, I think are suffering quite a bit with this, with the mm. lockdown basically. Mm. Not going to school, mm. I think very tough. I think there's a huge fear about going back to school, particularly mm. amongst kids with neurodevelopmental problems. So short answer, absolutely yes, this is a key and important concern of mine. I mean, we, we, uh, yes, I mean, it's a, it's a breeding ground for school phobia that, you know, that we used, to, we used to treat when we were working together and issues like that, increased OCD, increased eating disorders. There's a, a, there's a lot of concern out there. There is a lot of concern. So on that, on that not cheerful note, um, we will bring this session to an end. We are, we are uh, at time. And uh, first of all, can I remind you that tomorrow we'll have a change of pace with our longer interviews, the 7 p.m. slot. Um, tomorrow is gonna be Roger Kirby. We'll be talking to the wonderful Henry Marsh, neurosurgeon, author extraordinaire, a man definitely not one for political correctness. So whatever else, that won't be dull. And then back here on Thursday, it's me again, I'm afraid, with Gus O'Donnell, or God, as he was known from his initials, at the head of the civil, former head of the civil service, about crises, getting out of lockdown, trades off, economic consequences, and uh, should you stick to the rules or use your own judgment. 
So please use your judgment and come and listen then on Thursday. And then can I also now thank Tim and thank Ed. And uh, Tim, I don't think you do have a book, but uh, Ed, you definitely do. And I hope it's selling very well because it's highly relevant uh, to the current situation, the inflamed mind, uh, a, spl a splendid piece of brilliant scientific writing. So that's all from us. And uh, for the rest of you, um, until we meet again on Thursday, as ever, as they say in Hill Street Blues, be careful out there. Thanks, Good Sam. afternoon. Thanks, Sam.